Writer, producer, label president, Terrence Punch Henderson created an environment at Top Dog Entertainment where artists like Kendrick Lamar and SZA are able to succeed without compromise. This is his blueprint. You grew up in Watts in the 80s. What was your first sort of exposure to hip hop? My father would play Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh the show. We'd go pick my mom up from work. Like we'd play that every day. Um, Run DMC, LL, Kane, that sort of thing. Like that was my earliest moments. And then my father would make uh, mixtapes like just for the projects that circulate around the projects. So I guess he was an early mixtape DJ. So did you feel a connection to music from childhood? Absolutely, like we wake up to music playing to clean the house. And my pops used to call it a uh, clean up party. <laughs> like you just hear the music blasting downstairs, you come knocking on the door, handing out mops and brooms. So like music was always the integral part. And were you pursuing music in any sort of serious way then? No, I mean, I wasn't consciously, but I was studying the game the whole time. And I didn't realize it until I look back on it. Studying how? Source Magazine, like all hip hop publications, studying interviews, like that was really an interest of mine. So you graduate from high school and, you know, if we were to be interviewing Mm -hmm. 18 year old punch. Yeah. What what would he think the next 10 years would look like? I don't know. I wasn't never really passionate about anything except music, but I still wasn't considering music as a career. I would still be lost at that time. I wouldn't have no real answers for you. How did that sort of epiphany dawn on you? It was crazy. I was sitting on the phone talking to uh, one of my buddies and I had been writing a lot, like I really got serious in the writing. You know, I was sharing some of the stuff I was writing with with him over the phone. I'm like, yo, we should just start a label. We both love music. And if we try to put our money together and buy some equipment, we could record it. And then we'll just figure out the rest from there. Were you working a nine to five t in order to support what you were doing? Absolutely. I was working at Ikea, writing raps when there's no customers around. I'm on the phone with my boy, because he worked at Ikea too. He was okay. on the third floor, so I'm on the phone with him. We strategizing. Like, that was really my college experience. There was so many young people in that building, like, just trying to do different things. So, you know, we'd go to work and be working on our stuff. When we get off, we'd go over to his house to the studio, record. They fired me. They said I had no sense of urgency. <laughs> <laughs> so, ha at this juncture, had you met Top Dog yet? Yeah. He's your cousin. It's funny because his pictures of was like him holding me when I was a kid. Like to see that and then to see where we are now is it's crazy. He was there from the start of when I was trying to do what I was doing. And he'd give me a little advice on stuff that, you know, he was trying to do. So it was a constant conversation. If I had a question, I'd call him or whatever. How do you get from, you know, putting together this first studio, having loose conversations with Top Dog, but, you know, fundamentally doing your own thing? to deciding to combine forces. The conversations just grew more with, with me and Top. Remember one day he was like, you know, he liked the way I think, like when my mind work, I should just come over with him. And at the same time, I was reaching a limit with what I was doing. Cause it, like, it couldn't go no further. Like we didn't have the, the, the means. We couldn't be at all the spots we needed to. Mm -hmm. So we literally had jobs that we had to pay for stuff. So that was like, kind of killing us. Who was the first of the artists that is currently a TDE, on the TDE roster that you guys encountered? It was J-Rock. Okay. Yeah, he was the first one. And how did that, how did he sort of come into your... Side? That happened on accident, because uh, it was another guy from our neighborhood who was coming over recording. So one day Top was going to pick him up and he asked Top, could he bring J-Rock and another guy? So Top was like, cool. Wait for me, you know what I mean, on this street, I'll be there to pick y'all up. So, you know, when Top give you a time, like, you gotta, it's like the cable man, it's like a window, <laughs> a good four hour window. 
So the artist, the kid who was coming, he got impatient and he left. He was like, man, I'm good, I'm leaving. So the other two, J-Rock and the other guy was like, all right, we gonna stay then. So as soon as he left, maybe 20 minutes later, Top pulled up. I was like, yo, where's such and such? Like he left. All right, y'all wanna come record? Yeah, so they hopped in the car, heard J-Rock voice and it was over. It was just his, his tone. Like the way he sounded, like that, that voice shouldn't be coming out of his frame. So while while J Rock is sort of putting the pieces together, mm -hmm. all the other artists of your from your, the Black Hippie crew mm -hmm. start making their way into the studio and then onto the label as well, right? Well, Kendrick came maybe a month or two right after J Rock. He had a mixtape that was sitting in the studio, and uh, I asked Top what it was. He was like, "Oh, it's this kid." I'm gonna check it out. So I took it, put it in my car, and I'm listening. I'm like, yo, this dude can really rap. You hear a lot of Lil Wayne influence, a lot of Jay Z influence. But I'm like, he, he doing his stuff. So then maybe a week after that, I came back to the studio and Kendrick was in there recording. He was working on the chorus part and the way he was stacking the vocals on the hook. I'm like, all right, this kid got it. So from that moment, like I, I, I knew he was gonna be the one for sure. You get J Rock, then you get Kendrick, mm -hmm. and Schoolboy and Absol come mm -hmm. in the next six months or a year. Absol came maybe a year after Kendrick, and the way that happened was uh, Soundwave, our producer. So he had Absol at his house one day rapping for me. This was years before. You know, I mean, we got TDE formed, so it was all in the studio, and I was like, yo. Remember that kid you had rapping for me? Like, where is he? So he called him up and Soul came to the uh, studio. And then them three made a song that night, J-Rock, Soul, and Kendrick. Q became a member through uh, Ali. Like, Ali was playing. He's the mix engineer? He's the engineer. Okay. Ali's the engineer. He was playing uh, football at junior college in LA. And Q was on the team. So. After practice or whatever, Ali had come through mixing and he'd bring Q with him. I didn't even know he rapped. I don't think nobody did. He was just a cool cat, quiet, hanging in the back. And one day he uh he had like the, this verse on the wackest beat I ever heard in my life. Like the beat was made out of gun sounds. But he was spitting on it. So I'm like, yo, that's kinda crazy. So I just told him to keep coming, and keep rapping if you know what I mean, if you want to you want to try to pursue it. All of your artists are extremely talented lyricists, mm -hmm. but the type of music that they make is not really congruent with what is like popular in 2006, 2007. Right. How were you thinking about breaking all of them? I wasn't. I wasn't thinking about breaking them. Like we didn't have, we didn't have that industry experience to know what breaking the artist was. We were just trying to make the best music that we actually liked. As we grew in the in the, in the business, mm -hmm. we started trying to make the radio records. It was terrible. <laughs> like it just didn't work. It wasn't it wasn't a good feeling when you're trying that hard and then it's still not working. I was like, yo, all right, let's just make what we want to make. You guys start taking meetings um, mm -hmm. and shopping J-Rock. How did you end up settling on Asylum? It wasn't Asylum, it was uh, Warner. Okay. It just seemed like the right feel at the time. Like we were still, we were still green. We didn't know we got an offer. Like, all right, let's do it. Let's, just, let's get it. We thought as soon as we signed the deal, we we won. That's the end of the road. We got it. What did you realize? It wasn't the case. <laughs> like that was the furthest thing from the truth. Getting signed to a label looked like a big break, but it actually made the crew more vulnerable. Punch had to figure out how to give his artists the upper hand going forward. How did the situation at Warner fall apart? Well, what happened was when Asylum merged, we were just about to impact that radio. Like, J-Rock was as hot as he had ever been. We had the, the single with Lil Wayne that was moving. It was about to impact that radio. And they came a week before that and shut everything down. We didn't know how it worked, so we felt it was disrespectful right off top. Like, you just come shut it down, you don't talk to us or do none of that. So I started a rocky relationship with us and the guys who came in. So you negotiated a 
getting him off the label. That's a good word, negotiate it. <laughs> yeah. But I think we didn't fit and we didn't want to be there. I don't think they necessarily wanted us to be there. So it kind of, it was kind of an easy split. What were you and Top thinking in terms of how to, you know, overcome this setback and get the label and the sort of momentum back on track? Go straight to the people. Like we got this internet thing that's moving now. We got Twitter, whatever that is. We're trying to figure out how to use that. Like we, we, we don't have, we don't need a middleman. So we, if we can go directly to the people, then when it's time to deal with them again, if we want to, then we'll have leverage. So this is when you start putting out like overly dedicated Absolutely. and habits and contradictions. And yeah. stuff. The first one was uh, Kendrick Lamar EP, which the whole story behind that was, it was supposed to be about six songs. So I called the EP, but it was to um, introduce him as Kendrick Lamar because he was changing his name from K-Dot to Kendrick. And he was known locally as, as K-Dot. K-Dot, right. The first thing you do when you introduce yourself to somebody is you tell them your name. And that's how they get to know you and who you are. And at that time, he wanted to make more personal music. Like, before that, he was rapping for the sake of rapping. Rapping about rap. So it's like, tell stories and show your lyrical ability within those true stories. Like, that'll get the people right away. So the next big break for the label came in uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. You guys announced that you were signing Kendrick with Aftermath and Interscope. Right. How did that connection happen? I think Drake called uh, Top. He just called him out the blue. Like, uh, just, just, oh, hey, it's Dr. Dre. <laughs> right. I think Top hung up on him like, it's not no Dre. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. But uh, Dre said, he, he, I think he was either out of town or busy, and he went to get with Kendrick in like the next two weeks or so. How did you know that that was the right situation for you? He did exactly what he said. Like he said, he didn't want to change anything. He said he just wanted to enhance whatever he was doing. And the way he enhanced was by giving his insight, giving his opinions, and it, it worked out. Like it worked out for the best. What were the game-changing insights that he was able to provide you guys that took Good Kid from an amazing record to a classic. Just watching him, because he was recording uh, records at the same time. So I remember a time being at his house and he's working with Snoop. Snoop doing like an eight bar verse and Dre is not letting up on him. Like he's punching every other word. Like he tell you say it like this, try it like this. Snoop go back in, knocking it out, doing exactly how Dre wanted it done. So it's like that taught us to don't let up, you know what I mean? Just keep going until it sounds how you want it to sound. You know what I mean? And that's, that's one of the, the strong qualities that Dre instilled. One of the defining um, traits of all the projects that you guys have put out is that there is a more conceptual idea that sort of hinges them all together. Right. What's the process for your artist arriving at those concepts? Do you sit and talk with them? For hours. We spent more time talking in the studio than recording early on, for sure. Like, we'd all just be sitting around, just throwing out ideas or talking about whatever, from science to religion to history to what's going on in the neighborhood. Like, just talking, talking, talking. And through that, we developed certain concepts, certain ideas. The people that you work with somehow are, are able to transcend out of, you know, the space of hip hop music or mm -hmm. urban music and, you know, have earned the respect as some of the most important writers of right. their generation. Did you have any sense that that is what you were working with in 2009, 2010? That wasn't never the goal. The goal was to always touch people. So whatever came with that was cool. We were going against the grain of what was popular. Like we did that every time. If you look at, at the history, like we did a concept album, Kendrick first album, when the focus was singles. You know what I mean? He had a 12 minute song on his first album. 
Like that just wasn't happening. Everybody was trying to get the club record or the girl record or the radio record or whatever. By the end of 2014, you guys start branching out and you sign Isaiah Rashad and then SZA. Right. Now, I think for a lot of people who didn't really know what to make of what you and Top Dog were building, they looked at it as like, okay, well, they got that black hippie crew, that's gonna be the label. Right. And then all of a sudden you start signing these people from totally disparate places with totally disparate sounds. How did you look at those artists and, and think about building the roster? Both of them are so original and distinctive. The story with SZA is, when I met her, she was actually helping out with merch at a show we did with Kendrick. Ironically, her friend was listening to something she just recorded in the earphones. And I asked her what it was. She's like, it's her, she sing. And like her voice was so distinctive. Like I haven't heard anything like it. And then when I started listening to the words, she attacked it as a lyricist. I'm like, oh, okay, I know what that is. I know how to work with that. And then with Isaiah, the first thing that caught me was the pain in his voice. Like it's a certain level of, of pain that he has that just cuts through the record, like every time out. And then two, he knew how to write a song at a very young age. Last uh, October, I think it was, uh, SZA tweeted that she didn't wanted to quit music, <laughs> and if you wanted to put out the album, you could put it out, whatever. Right. <laughs> what was going on behind the scenes? I think she was going through a lot, like personally. She had some stuff going on, like family or whatever. And we talking about the album, and she was talking about her sound and hit records. I'm like, yo, you don't have a sound yet. You don't have hit records yet. She got hot, she didn't like that. <laughs> so like immediately after we hung up, that was the tweet that went out. I was like, yo, you can put out my album if you want. But like, it was just a, like a spare of the moment conversation. It happens all the time. You usually don't go to, go to the tweets. I understand with SZA, you were responsible for pushing the album back and also for forcing her to write all of the songs herself. Mm -hmm. How did you arrive at that decision? And two, how did you communicate that and get her on board with that? Well, she's a very, very complex artist, complex person. So she don't view herself all the time how the masses actually view her. Like she'll do something incredible, everybody will love it, and she'll feel like, eh, it's okay. Then it'll be, I hate it. So it's like trying to navigate through that. I don't want to kill her process at the same time. So it's like, you, you threaten the needle with it. Like you gotta be very cautious and very delicate on, on how you approach that situation. But at some point you gotta say, all right, stop the album coming out or stop recording because it'll go on forever. What role would you say that you've played in all of the artists in their growth over the last you know, half decade? I think I'm more of the, uh, the confirmation because they, they all know that I can, I can write, I record, like they respect what I do musically as well. Like I've always been a writer, but I never considered to be a rapper though. So they know I understand them more than the average business person would or the average label person would because I know what it's like to be stuck on a bar or I know what it's like to deliver a certain lyric a certain way. So it's a, it's a deeper connection. So they know they can always call me like, yo, what you think about this? And I would give them exactly what it is. Like I can give them insight, more, way more insight on it. Are we ever gonna see the Punch solo project? Man, <laughs> I hope so, man. But it's just like once I get going on it, something else will come up where I gotta focus more attention on that. And then I, you know, like I get set back and lose inspiration, then I gain it again. It, it'll take a lot of time, and time is something I don't have a lot of. As TDE's success grows, Punch maintains control by seeking wise mentors, keeping his priorities straight, and never stopping the grind. When you look back at the last decade, 
what are the moments that stand out to you as the ones you're the most proud of? Kendrick Lamar EP came out and the song Faith with me and Kendrick on there. We did an uh, in-store signing and this girl came up to Kendrick crying and said that this song saved her life. Like when I seen that, I'm like, all right, this is why we do it. Like this is the whole reasoning right here. Like whatever was said on that record touched her so much that it changed something in her life. Like that's outside of just music. So that was one moment and then as of late, I guess I would say it was SZA Project. Like I know everything she's been through and her struggle as an artist, as a person, and to see the success of this album and how people respond to it, there's nothing like it. Who are the people in the space that you still draw inspiration from, either the you know on the label side or the artist? No, I get a lot of inspiration from Jay. You know what I mean, I, I talk to him pretty frequently, and just the the small tidbits of information that he gives, like helps with so much. Like that's one of my, my biggest inspirations. Uh, 50 early on, still like there's certain jewels that he had dropped that always just sticks with me. But now like Top is in that space, so I still draw inspiration from him, of course, and I get to see that like up close and personal every day. What do you think the most important attributes of his personality are to the success of the label you guys run together? Uh, his patience. Uh, he's not gonna move unless it's his time to move. Uh, that taught me a lot. Like it's, it's times when I'm looking at him like he crazy. Like, yo, <laughs> they offering this much. Like, who, who we doing? <laughs> I'm like, nah, it's not right. But just for him to sit back and be patient like that just taught me everything. At this point, TDE is extremely successful and very well established. Mm -hmm. Where are you on your journey, if you had to sort of map it? Are you halfway there? I'm not really goal driven. That's not my thing. I just enjoy making the music and touching people. Like once it touches the people and it moves them a certain way, I guess that's the goal that's being fulfilled. Everything else that comes with it is, like I said, it's, it's cool. I appreciate it for sure. But the main focus is to change something about somebody's life. Are you a competitive person? For sure. Go super hard. But I'm not going to cry if I lose. What does money mean to you? Uh, money is just a means to, just a means to live, really. I've never been money driven. I always want to be cool, of course be able to do what I need to do. But my goal is not to, you know, have a money phone on my ear. Like, I still even haven't even bought a car yet. Really? Living in LA? Yeah. I mean, of course, I get around, but like, I haven't went out and splurged on, I mean, the whip. Mm -hmm. So whatever, I just need to get to the studio. You know, when you start the label, everyone is living together, sleeping on the floor, enduring the hardship. Mm -hmm. and, and in certain ways, that's incredibly challenging. But in other ways, it's, it makes it much easier to keep a certain sort of consistency philosophically mm -hmm. within the artists and the products that you're putting out. Now that you've started to expand and enjoyed this success, right. how do you keep that brand integrity as you scale? We try to remember those days when we were all together. Like we try to keep that at the forefront and never lose sight of that. Like our motto is hustle like you broke. So if, if once we keep that in mind, I mean, everything kind of stays intact. But of course it gets tough. Like the more success, the further everybody separates. And it's not a bad thing, it's just expansion. But as long as everybody keep the goal in mind, we pretty much stay intact. <laughs>